My backpack weighed in at 63 pounds, and I was going to have to carry that for the next 42 miles down the Bright Angel Trail of the Grand Canyon, all the way to the other side and back. During that breathtaking trip, in spite of that heavy pack, I took along my Kindle Paperwhite. And on that Kindle was a load of books, but I brought it to read only two. And I read them to my 14-year-old son under the stars each night. One was called Timefulness by geophysicist Marsha Bjornerud. Today on The Soul of Life, I had the pleasure of meeting Dr. Bjornerud to talk about her book, Timefulness, How Thinking Like a Geologist Can Help Save the World. For a society, it's not so good to be preoccupied with the now. In fact, it's the root of many of our problems, social, environmental, even spiritual, to be in the immediate narcissistic moment (laughs) and not understand our place in time. We get a geologist's view of what Marcia calls chronophobia, the fear of time. I would say as a scientist, my sense of awe in the natural world, (laughs) you know, is it's only enhanced by my scientific understanding. I I am reverential of the complexity of the natural world, the creation, however you want to imagine it came into being. I do have almost a spiritual response to my scientific understanding of that. I don't know about you, but thinking about existence beyond our next meal or beyond the next email or text is a challenge for me sometimes. Never mind thinking beyond the narrow focus of an election cycle. That's why Marcia says thinking on long timescales is something we must do if we're going to move out of this adolescent relationship to the earth that we seem to have. The earth is complicated and we need all hands on deck and all minds of many different types to contribute to this this work. There's so much exciting science to be done. I'm Keith Miller, and my podcast, The Soul of Life, is here to help you remember who you really are. I'll bring together people who have gotten off their treadmills. I'll have conversations with athletes, musicians, doctors, scientists, healers, and entrepreneurs to discuss the fascinating edges of our knowledge in neurobiology, psychology, and physics. This is The Soul of Life. Really excited to have Marsha Bjornarud, a professor and chair of geology at Lawrence University on the soul of life today. She was the 2000-2001 Fulbright Scholar. She lives in Appleton, Wisconsin, where she teaches. And the reason I'm speaking with her today is because of her book, Timefulness, How Thinking Like a Geologist Can Help Save the World. Marsha, welcome. Thanks, Keith. Great to be with you. Really great to be with you, too. I, uh, I reached out to you and I shared with you that I had a personal connection to your writing. And... Um, that I took it on me uh, on a trip my son and I took to the Grand Canyon uh, this past April. Was it March or April? I can't remember. We were supposed to go in April. We went in March because of COVID. The, sh- the schools had just closed down and uh, we had this trip planned for spring break. And I said to my son, you know, we had this plan for two years and <laughs> we were training. We were all geared up. I said, we're not going to be able to go in two weeks if we wait. So we get on the next plane. It was like a private plane and we got there, went into the Grand Canyon, rim to rim to rim, 42 miles. And it was a big hike for us um, down to the North Rim, which is, as you as you know, uh, unoccupied during the winter. So we had it to ourselves and it was glorious. And uh, we took your book, well, I took my Kindle, which, um, and, I, and I read two books to my son every night, who's 14 years old. And we, we camped under the, uh, under the stars, um, at the Bright Angel campground, and I, we read. I read uh, to him your book, Timefulness, and I'm excited to speak with you about uh, what you wrote about because it's so, I think, moving. Your 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 book is about geology, of course, and you know we got to experience this kind of going back in time, uh, going down into the Grand Canyon, of course, getting away. It's the ultimate social distancing, but your stories about the earth and the time scale that is right under our feet was really a, it was like a gift is is what I want to say. And so I'm glad you're here. Can you explain timefulness? Can you sum it up for people? Well, it sort of rhymes with, with mindfulness. So it's deliberately kind of pointing that direction, which is I think a good practice for individuals to, we usually think of it being present in the now. 
But I use the, the term sort of provocatively to push back against that a little bit because I think for a society, it's not so good to be preoccupied with the now. In fact, it's the root of many of our problems, social, environmental, even spiritual, to be in the immediate narcissistic moment <laughs> and not understand our place in time. So to me, timefulness is a sense of place in time, how we fit into the larger narrative of the natural world, um, making peace with our inevitable mortality, frankly, but also understanding how human activities and our own personal activities fit within the framework of natural processes and um, phenomena. And I, so I often say that we are, as a society, temporally illiterate. We, we, we are time illiterate. People don't generally have a sense for how long geologic processes take or what the characteristic time scales of different geologic phenomena are. So as an educator, I spend a lot of my own time <laughs> talking about time and trying to gain, give people a sense of perspective on how quickly the natural world can change and argue that it's um, in many cases much closer to human time scales than we typically think. Right, right. And, and, and you know, I'll just make a connection here. You, you, you speak about chronophobia um, from the Greek chronos. Um, and, and that, that struck me, of course, I'm somebody that, that as a, as a professional, uh, psychotherapist works with, work with people who are uh, dealing with all sorts of phobia, phobias. And I've never heard that phobia before, but it really resonated for me as I was going through my own personal kind of spiritual crisis and realizing, well, and I'll say coming out of not just the Grand Canyon, it just happened to coincide that we were doing this huge uh, trip down to the center of the earth, it felt like, and then coming out of that. But coming out of my depression um, was, uh, the key for me was, uh, it was a lot of things, but one of the keys that I remember was uh, just remembering who I am and not being afraid of embracing where I am. And, and, and that, that just resonated when I was reading about your discussion about chronophobia. Can you talk about that a little bit more? Yeah, so this chronophobia, I think I made the term up, <laughs> but fear of time emanates from so many different sources. Some are, are understandable, our own fear of our own mortality and the mortality of, of, of our loved ones around us. Also vanity, fear of aging, but then that's fed upon in a society that venerates everything that is young and new. Um, so I think our own culture Western culture and American culture in particular has made that almost a pathology. You know, it's a natural thing to, to be afraid of death, but, but then to fear any signs of aging or <laughs> um, you know, the passage of time is a problem. But then there are other kinds of chronophobia ranging from young earth creationism, which we maybe will talk about, to subtler forms that are baked into our capitalistic system, which really doesn't want to acknowledge that nature will change, wants to assume that nature will continue to be stable and predictable. Um, and, and somehow that it will always serve us. I mean, it seems to me that that the, the idea, whether we get into whether we're for or against certain um, economic systems, um, the idea that there is an unlimited um, supply of stuff and, and that, that, that growth is the only indicator of success or life. Yeah. And I always compare it to, it sounds like your adolescent children are, are more enlightened, but adolescents in general are preoccupied with their own moment in their lives mm. and take, take um, as a given the stability of the world around them. The, the parents will always be there. The, the teachers and the support people who are around will always be there for them, no matter what, they do. <laughs> and as you get older, you realize, um, you know, the world that you knew as a, a child and a, an adolescent actually was a temporary thing and people pass on and then you start valuing more what, what you once had. And I think we have a kind of adolescent relationship with the earth. We assume that it is impassive and nothing that we could do to it could possibly have any effect. And unfortunately, that is to our own detriment. Um, 
psychologically and pragmatically. Right, right. It's like a time denial um, mm-hmm. obsession. We'll we'll talk about how that shows up in in different things later. But but I want to I want to speak uh, ask you to speak about your your writing in in your book Timefulness. Um, you spend a lot of time bringing us as the reader into the world of geology, which which I deeply appreciate it as a fan of science. Um, that could have been another life for me. I, I just love, and I'm always kind of a spectator, I think, to scientists and, and science writing. And and so you you write very clearly and in, in an engaging way. Um, and still, I, I'll I'll admit I had I had it on my nightstand, and and it was it was also easy to fall asleep to. I'm not saying it was boring in any shape of the form, form, but but there is, I think you will agree that there there is so much depth, right, into there's so much information and, but yet you, you make it um, come to life and you talk about time scales in a way that we can understand specifically. I remember uh, we've hiked on the Appalachian trail quite a bit of times and, and we're trying to do the sections and my son has on, you know, on his list, like we've got to get these sections done and we're going up and down. So um, coming to find out that the Appalachian trail mountain range, the Appalachians actually fit like a glove into ranges. Maybe you can tell me where this is in, in the UK or Ireland. Uh, it's yeah, mind, exactly. So the Appalachians are essentially half of a great mountain belt that formed mm, around 400 million years ago. Of course, mountains take time to form, so it wasn't one day. <laughs> but um, that, that formed and created the, the supercontinent Pangaea, which many people have heard of. And the other half when the modern Atlantic opened was stranded on the opposite side of the Atlantic and includes the Caledonide chain in the UK and then continuing up into Scandinavia and even the high Arctic regions um, of, of Norway and Canada. So yeah, it was a great mountain belt that formed and was largely eroded to sea level and then buried <laughs> and is now being re-exhumed by erosion. Wow. So one one big idea. I'm my field is structural geology, which has to do with tectonics and mountain building. Um, and as I always say, that takes some patience to study how mountains grow. <laughs> but we can look at at mountains that have formed in the past and have been torn down by erosion, and and in in the process, we can see inside mountains and get a sense for the processes that form them. And and it's quite clear that mountains are ephemeral features on the Earth's surface. That they're we moving. Think of them as the, Timeless things, exactly. They're they're formed, they grow, and even as they're growing, they're being dismantled by erosion. And so they exist for a time. For a while, the tectonics has the upper hand, but in the end, erosion always wins. <laughs> and the constituents of the mountains are recycled and rock cycle. And um, yeah, so mountains are are not forever. Right, they're more fluid than we we assume. I mean, I think in our in our language, in our literature, in our culture, we use metaphors of rock, bedrock. We talk about the immovability. I mean, these are ancient ancient um, metaphors. Ever since language, probably we've been talking about how rocks are just the solid ground of, of course, of the basis of our life. And I think you describe how rocks, without rocks, we wouldn't exist. It's not just something to walk around on. It's it's biochemically essential to the environment. The part of everything is knit together. I spoke with a, um, um, a science writer, an astrophysics science writer recently about his book about Einstein. And he talked about how the cosmos, in fact, is just seething. The, the, what we used to think of as the void of space is seething with particles and antiparticles coming in, matter and antimatter, in and out of existence, in that even rocks themselves are, I, would, I don't know if you'd use the word seething, but they have, they have properties that are um, connected to everything that's happening in our bodies, everything that's happening around us. Absolutely. And, and one little mantra that I have is that rocks are not nouns, they're verbs. <laughs> I love that. They, they pay, you know, they're action things. They came into being, they're, they're still becoming, they're not just inert, passive things. Right, right. I mean, obviously, maybe it's not obvious, but I'll say like native cultures have traditions in which they, uh, I mean, some would say as maybe on the outside by observing it, they're worshiping nature, they're worshiping objects. It, it's a, a lot more complex than that, um, that they are, they are in conversation with mm nature and they are in conversation with all things because all things are in fact living and they knew this far before we had 
electron scanning micro, uh, microscopes to see that things are moving around at the subatomic level. Um, I, I want to talk to you about the, 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 the reason, the point of all of this. I mean, why is it important to know that, for example, Mount Everest is, um, is shrinking? Is, am I getting that right? Mount Everest is shrinking like it's going well, it's, away. It, it's- it's kind of in a steady state. It's still being pushed up, oh, it's but pushing erosion up. I see. is keeping up with, with, yeah. So that's one of the amazing things about the earth is that the tectonic processes that are driven by the internal heat of the earth are about balanced by the external processes of erosion driven by gravity and the sun's energy. Um, but yeah, why is it, why does it matter for the average person to know that? Mm. Well, I think, you know, maybe not that fact in specific, but I think they're both pragmatic and, philosophical slash spiritual reasons for having some sense of how the earth works. Um, you know, first of all, most of us will spend all our lives here. <laughs> and if we don't understand how the planet works, we're diminished in some way. We don't know our home. Mm. Um, and I sometimes say that people, too many earthlings are kind of like bad tourists on the earth that they're visiting, except we're not visiting. We're here permanently and haven't bothered to learn anything about the language and the culture of the place. Right. And if, if you're, if you're someone who travels and, and you just don't even try to understand the place where you're visiting, your experience of that is going to be very shallow. Right. Right. That, that's an argument. Yeah. Um, it's, a, it's a good argument. I mean, and I, and I feel like there's probably both ends to, to be said with one, one, which is that, um, yes, you know, we, we, we can have you know, the consumerism sort of tourism, consumer tourism, is on the one hand shallow, and on the other hand, it does expose us. I, there was there's a case. I, I won't get into specific, specifics, but <laughs> there, there, it's not funny. But there, there are cases where pe- you know, the a wealthy group of people are, um, you know, the one place where they go to recreate and hunt. Well, if that's if there's a, a gold mine going in there, well, we got to mm-hmm. stop that because this is where wealthy people hunt. Um, mm-hmm. So there, there can be maybe a balance between. Uh, ecotourism, I suppose you'd call it. But um, yeah. I wonder about the Grand Canyon. You, you specifically, if we can talk about tourism for a moment, because um, it doesn't sound like you're against tourism at all. It's just that you know when you go, um, go mindfully and go respectfully and and go to learn and listen to what the Earth is is saying. Um, mm-hmm. In the Grand Canyon, I'm wondering what your experiences have been. I mean, so many people listening have had experiences is one of the most, well, it's grand, right? It's, it's one of a very unique place on earth. Not many, if, if, if any places like it anywhere. Um, and, uh, I remember specifically walking on the North Kaibab trail. You, you, we descended on the South Kaibab trail and then, um, or rather, um, bright angel and then linked up with the North Kaibab trail and on the North Kaibab, the trail winds precipitously, um, close to the ledge. And we had the sense, I mean, you can see that the, the earth is moving all around you uh, mm-hmm. as you're descending through these layers um, because there's rock slides and boulders and things that haven't been cleared on your trail, maybe because nobody found them yet. Um, and you're wondering when, when is the next one coming? And then we, we saw this, um, these markings. And of course there were uh, ancient people that lived there uh, pre um, uh, civilization or early civilizations. Um, and so we, we looked at these markings very, very closely on the ledge and we, and we saw how uniform they were. It was like a, almost like a meteor had struck or something. And we thought for a second, what could this be? And then all of a sudden we realized that these were dynamite holes. Oh. And these were blasted edges of the cliff. And so we were just walking on borrowed, literally borrowed, carved out, you know, a section that had literally been built because so much of the trail is highly maintained and highly built just in order to get up the cliff. Um, what's, what's your experience has been in the Grand Canyon as a geologist? Well, unbelievably, um, I had not seen the Grand Canyon until five years ago. Wow, yeah. <laughs> so I have, as a geologist, I have been all over the world. I've worked in extremely high Arctic regions that are very inaccessible. I've lived in New Zealand and Norway and the UK. I've traveled extensively, (laughs) but I'd not been to the Grand Canyon. And so this was sort of a a little secret. Um, No, certainly (laughs) I wanted to. I I didn't mean to out you about this much. (laughs) 
so anyway, finally, about five years ago, um, I took a trip to the Grand Canyon and yeah, it's, it's grand and amazing. And I had almost felt irritated sometimes about the Grand Canyon in teaching geology because mm. it's almost sort of a visual cliche for geologic time. And one of my, um, purposes in writing for general audiences is to convince people that geology is everywhere, not right. just in the Grand Canyon. Right. <laughs> but then when I saw the Grand Canyon, it's like, oh my it's like, gosh. Yeah, it's, it's yeah. Hard, so, hard to... So, you know, I'm not denying that, that the Grand Canyon is grand. And it's just, it's, it's special because it's just such a deep slice. Mm -hmm. And you can see the records of such a long time. But I'll, I will point out that here in Wisconsin, we have rocks that are a billion years older than the oldest rocks in the Grand Canyon. <laughs> And in southern Minnesota, we have rocks that are about 1.7 billion years older than the oldest rocks in the Grand Canyon. But who's it's keeping track? A, yeah, nobody's, you know, it's no. all <laughs> wonderful rock. But um, it's just that we can see so much of the history of the mm. earth that is cloaked otherwise by vegetation, which I like. Vegetation is good. <laughs> or you know, less, less extreme topography. So that's why it's special. It's just right. so but undeniable. It's so exposed. It's there in your face. Yeah. And there's such a long story there. And um, it's just such a, an elemental place. Um, right, you know. right. Yeah, there, there is, I'll, I'll probably do more uh, episodes to, to talk about the history of that, of that land, um, the native history, and then how the, how the park was preserved as well, because it is, it is a very fascinating story. It was in private hands for many years. And then, um, uh, the the U.S. Park Service um, took over and and preserved a great great pieces of this, um, thankfully and, and um, luckily. Um, the other book that I took and read to my son was called The Emerald Mile, and I'll just mention this in passing, and we'll and we'll move on. But The Emerald Mile is about the speed record of people who ran the Colorado River rapids in in dories, these little wooden boats, and it's a just fascinating book about the manic uh, uh, behavior of, of this particular man who just, who took that on him. But he goes into, it's such a beautiful story of environmentalism because he talks about the founding of the Sierra Club um, because of the, the, the anti-dams, um, yeah. you know, fighting the dams that would have, would have actually dammed up um, the Colorado even more. Um, Tell me about the. Uh, you mentioned geology is everywhere, and, and that I, I didn't. I didn't mean to sort of uh, hijack that because you know it, I get the irony of saying, well, well, what about the Grand Canyon? When in fact your your big thing is talking about the the not so grand things. What what can people see in their own state? You're in Wisconsin. You mentioned you know the the fascinating age of the rock beneath your feet. Where where what else can people find? Well, every place has a geologic story. It's just not as blatant or in your face as in the in the Grand Canyon. I mean, here in Wisconsin, we have three big chapters. One would be the Precambrian time, where we have igneous and metamorphic rocks that record multiple tectonic events. So people don't think of Wisconsin as a hotbed of tectonic activity, and it's not today. But in the past, we had every type of plate boundary setting that we can see around the world today at different times in the past. We have the great banded iron formations that record the oxygenation of the atmosphere by photosynthesizing organisms 2 point something billion years ago. Then we have a long unconformity, same as the great unconformity in the Grand Canyon. And we have a long record that follows that of marine sedimentation. So this was once the continental shelf and much of the central part of the U.S. was a big continental shelf. I mean, let me just um, let me just say stop for a second because so, so people understand what that means. It was the bottom of the of the ocean. Yeah, yeah, very similar to off the coast of the east coast of the U.S. today, where sediment is accumulating in in sh relatively shallow waters. Right. And right. about the same time, the Appalachians were growing, so the the bedrock here was being deposited in a shallow continental shelf setting at about the time that the the Appalachian colloidal mountain chain and Pangaea were forming. Mm -hmm. And then we have another long unconformity or hiatus in the geologic record of time. And then the glaciers came through just the other day. <laughs> <laughs> Relatively and, speaking. Um, yeah. And the landscape here, it's, and it's so obvious. It's, it's glaciated. Once you start getting tuned into that, it's just a casual glance. Like, oh, of course, that's a moraine. And the, the, the mm. features are, are so obviously glacial. I mean, so, I will, so New, a story. New York City, for example, was, was 
a complete glacier in very recent history? Like what was, what was the dates of that? So the last glacial maximum was about 18,000 years ago. So Central Park probably would have been under a thousand or more feet of ice as recently as that. Right. You right. in the Chesapeake Bay area are, were not glaciated, but you were just beyond the extent of the last ice age and the land still remembers that. So one really practical thing that people need to know, for example, in your area is that during the ice age, the land that was under the ice was depressed by the weight of the ice and is today rebounding. This is Lake Michigan, for example, is tilting because of the, the difference in ice mass between the northern and the southern area. So it's mm. tilting towards Chicago. Wow. But the areas that were just outboard of the maximum extent of the ice during the ice age were actually slightly bulged up during the ice age. Then the ice went away. The areas that were under the ice are rebounding, but the areas that were bulged up are sinking. And so that's an unfortunate thing at a time when sea level is also rising. Right. The land is sinking at the same time that sea level is rising. And right. so it compounds the problem of flooding in coastal areas. Yeah. So that's one example of, of having, we need to have this understanding of the, the recent and more distant geologic past to understand why things are the way they are today. Right, right. It, 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 you mentioned this, and I, and I want to surface this again, that, that um, geologists, the, the career tra track for geologists are typically, is I think, dr somewhat profit-driven, at least now, because of uh, geology being associated with petrochemical and mining and all of those lucrative industries. Um, uh, but but you're, you're, it sounds like you're committed to, or you took a different track. Why did, why did you not go into work for ExxonMobil? <laughs> Yeah, frankly, most of the people that I went to graduate school with in my field of structural geology did end up with going into the oil industry. And um, an understanding of geology, by the way, is key to the oil and gas that we, we use. And anybody who wants to deny the reality of the age of the earth really should not be using oil and gas because it's brought to you by people who understand yeah. it. Yeah. But so geology does have a really long and kind of complicated relationship with stewardship of the earth. Because a lot of what we know, frankly, has been thanks to geophysical surveys and drilling that's been done in the, in the search for oil and minerals. But I think most geologists, including those who work in extractive industries, you can't help but <laughs> pause and um, think seriously about how we're using these, these commodities and how especially the combustion of fossil fuels inevitably changes the carbon cycle in profound ways. But I, I admit, I mean, geology is not exactly, um, it, it is culpable for many <laughs> environmental problems, but it has also shed light on the way the earth system works. Right, right. Um, it wasn't my path. I, I felt I, I was more of an academic, I suppose, and I, was, I wanted to have curiosity-driven research. I didn't want to be exclusively um, searching for, for oil and gas. <laughs> I also felt early on that I just couldn't believe how little of any of this I was exposed to in high school and felt really compelled to try to dispel this earth illiteracy that I was talking about earlier. And that's right. what I've dedicated my teaching career to and increasingly my writing to. Right, um, right. And, and why do you think that is? I mean, uh, Indiana Jones aside, uh, in the 80s, the popularization of, of sort of explorer, adventurer, geologists, or archaeologists, I should, and I shouldn't conflate the two, but, um, the, you know, it, it, why do you think that is? It, it, you know, you, I, I, I kind of joked in my email to you that you're, you're a nonconformity, in fact, that, that actually you, you decided, even though you are in the academic world, in your book, Timefulness, you decided to write I think with passion and conviction, something that in academia is usually shunned, uh, looked down upon. Um, you, you took a stand on, or you, and you are taking a stand on things that you think are just um, unnegotiable as it, as it relates, but you're doing it from a science grounding. How, what, what was that like to step outside the walls, so to speak, of uh, academia in that sense? Well, I, I'm, I guess I'm lucky in a number of ways. I teach at a, a liberal arts college, and scholarship is defined fairly broadly here. We certainly are expected to be active in our, our fields as teacher scholars, but um, I 
have the luxury of, of doing this other kind of scholarship, which is writing for popular audiences. So just my own place allows me to do that. I also have tenure, <laughs> so I that have helps. some freedom there. And I guess I have increasingly just thought of what I want my own legacy to be and what I can contribute um, as someone, I guess, maybe because I was a woman going into a field, very do male dominated field when I was in graduate school, I always had the slight feeling of being an outsider looking in on the field that I am now very much an insider in, <laughs> mm. but I had the feeling that I wasn't welcome. And I remember the, that feeling. And so I feel like I can be a translator to people mm. who may not feel invited into the room as scientists. Mm. Um, another thing that's influenced my writing is here at Lawrence university, we have a beautiful Scandinavian style lodge on Lake Michigan, where we, in the summertime, we, we have elder hostel type classes, or it's not only for older people, but anyone who wants to spend an immersive week learning about a topic. And so I've taught quite a few courses there to people of all stripes and ages. And I see a real yearning to understand um, landscapes that are familiar to people and to understand the earth and, you know, and to really in a non-partisan way, talk about climate change. Um, right. And so I, I sensed that there was really an appetite out there for people to, to come together, be, be shown more than just a peephole view. Um, you know, people hear a lot about dinosaurs and there are a lot of books out there about rock and mineral identification, <laughs> but there are too many that really provide a narrative that's palatable, readable, and provides a more holistic view of the earth system in a way that, that again, is not um, partisan and is not trying to advocate a particular <laughs> yeah. political point of view. Right, right. So it, I it's, that's where I can contribute. You're listening to the Soul of Life podcast with me, Keith Miller. Every week I bring you a new episode that hopefully inspires you to reflect more on who you are and who you want to be in this rapidly changing world. If this time we share together moves you somehow closer to who you are or lights up parts of you that have been unplugged, I want to hear from you. And please share the love. Take a moment to find the Soul of Life podcast in the social media where you hang out on iTunes, Facebook, Instagram, or YouTube, and let me know who you are. To, to use a, a word that is resonant in your field, I, I think, and, and in, in my field as well, in psychology, it's, it's, I, to me, it's, it's moving. It's, it's about movement. And, mm -hmm. and this, you, you, when, you, when you mentioned the spirituality of this work, um, and in our work in psychology, when we begin to realize that there are things, when we, we can talk about all the techniques and science about the brain and everything, but at the end of the day, it's about moving. And, and that's what the word emotion really means in Latin, to move. Oh, of course. Yeah. And so, you know, that is what we are, is we are, you know, you mentioned how rocks are verbs. We are, our, our DNA, every, everything is moving in us constantly. It never stops moving. And so um, it seems to me that that's, that's the way, and I, you know, that's frankly why I started this podcast, is to get, bring people together who are moving to that rhythm and listening to that music <laughs> and realizing that there's a, a way to get in tune with themselves that, that allows them to get in tune with others. And then you can get more in tune with yourself and so forth. Um, my daughter just the other day, and by the way, my son is, is the science sort of geek nerd, I guess I'd say, so self, self-described um, where he, you know, he had the periodic table memorized probably in like the third grade and could tell me all the functions of all the, all the elements. Um, and so, our, but our daughter came home from school just the other day and she's in seventh grade. She said, dad, I think I know what I want to be when I grow up. And this was, she does not even know about the book that I read to our son, your book. Um, she said, I want to be a geologist. Wow. <laughs> I was just stunned. And so I said, well, tell me more. And so it was, she just, she was touched. <laughs> she had something had touched her soul about the lesson she had at school. And so, um, but you mentioned that it, geology is not, emphasized in middle or high school uh, or even in college unless, you know, and it's even maybe discouraged among the sciences. Um, I, I don't know if that's true or can you speak to that? Why, why is it that way? And what, what, what would you like to see happen? Yeah. I mean, it, I think it's typically that way. There may be exceptions here and there. California, I understand does have a little bit more 
presence of rigorous earth science in a tectonically active area. But yeah, by and large in the United States, geology is just not represented in high school curricula in the same way that physics, chemistry, and biology are. There's no AP course in geology. Um, and it, if people are exposed to it, it might be in eighth grade as earth science. It's very kind of taxonomic. It's about, you know, what is this mineral? What is that mineral? And people therefore draw the erroneous conclusion that geology is sort of a dull science. Mm. It's about, you know, just identifying rocks and minerals and maybe fossils in boxes. Um, <laughs> I know still sometimes people refer to the intro geo course at the college level as rocks for jocks. It's just <laughs> hurts. <laughs> and it, it, it reflects sadly just the evolution of the, our discipline um, in the context of when high school curricula were being codified in this country. I think geology is a late bloomer. We really did not have a good understanding of how the solid earth works, which is plate tectonics until 1965. <laughs> That's astounding. That's like yesterday. Right? I know. And so, um, you know, at, in 1905, that was Einstein's, miracle year. He came up with general relativity. And, and by the early 20th century, we had a good understanding of the, um, the structure of the atom. And so, and then that was the same time that high school curricula were kind of being defined. So I think it's just a historical accident. And people have this very outmoded understanding of what geology is. It's, it's not just about dusty museum collections, and it's not only about oil and gas and mineral extraction. It is the way the earth works. And the earth is complicated and we need all hands on deck and all mm. minds of many different types to contribute mm -hmm. to this, this work. There's so much exciting science to be done. And I, I do find it interesting that I, I'm, I'm a geophysicist by training. So I, I get some physics journals and one, it's a newsletter, Physics Today from the American Physical Society. More and more I see in their articles, they're, they're really about earth systems things. Um, it's almost like physics has run out of <laughs> things that physicists can study without huge, huge grants. And they're saying it like, oh, these are really interesting questions. They're geophysical questions. So um, it's frustrating to many of us as, as geoscientists that people have this kind of Victorian idea of what geology is. And, and it, it matters because it's, it's about... Um, learning to live peaceably on this very dynamic, always moving, always changing earth. Right. And, you know, the, there are going to be large earthquakes. There are going to be tsunamis. Climate change is real. We should have people who understand these things. We need people in politics. We need people in the business community to have a clear eyed understanding of what probably lies ahead. Right. It's, just, it's, it's in all of our best interests, even if even if somebody is a pure capitalist and just wants to make money, it, it should. And, and thankfully, we are seeing I'm just going to I'm going to just going to mention oil companies for a second. We are seeing like BP, for example, whatever you want to say about some of these oil companies coming out and saying we are no longer investing in any more oil extraction. I think they were the first one to start uh, with that announcement. Um, so, because they want to protect shareholder value, they're doing it, right? So, I mean, it, it's, it can work. We can make money and save the earth at the same time, I'm pretty sure. Um, I want to talk about, you mentioned the Victorian um, era, and since my work, my life's work has been helping people, some would say they go to their therapists and kind of work on, you know, things that are happening in their past, sometimes ancient past for them, or, or there's skeletons in their closet and they, they need you know, some, some help um, opening things up. Again, these metaphors we use, I think are very similar to, to the metaphors that may be relevant in your field, digging down, <laughs> right, to our, in, in, within our psyche. And you mentioned uh, our country's evolution um, and, and, and that we're at this sort of adolescent, or our, our world is at this adolescent stage. Well, and now back to curriculum, you mentioned that there's sort of a an accident that the, um, dead geology really wasn't emphasized. And I, as a therapist, sort of, if I were to diagnose our country based on what you just said, that actually there was some sort of um, some sort of trauma that might have been occurring at that time. And I wanted to ask you how this, how this relates to um, where geology took a turn for the worse in in history, particularly in this country, because it wasn't true. Uh, uh, um, geology wasn't always at odds with um, religion, 
And once upon a time, you write about at length, this was fascinating to me as somebody who studied the Christian religion, that dominant Christian theology in America was very compatible with scientific discoveries. In fact, it was a, a minister who is also a farmer that discovered one of the most important geological foundations in the field. Um, can you speak about that time before it was at odds with, I would, I'm just going to say Christianity, some forms of Christianity um, that believe that the earth is a recently formed event. Um, and, and, and why did it change? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it, I'm increasingly fascinated by intellectual history as I get older, I guess, you know, how, how did we get ideas and how, what social and political forces shaped them. So you're right. If we, go right back to the start of modern geology, we can identify one person who I do think rightfully is kind of called the father of geology, James Hutton, a Scotsman, who was sort of on the fringes of the Edinburgh Enlightenment. He knew people like James Watt and David Hume, the philosopher. Um, Anyway, he wasn't a minister, but he was a deeply devout religious person. And he was a gentleman farmer who owned lots of land on the, the coast of Scotland. And every year he saw how much soil was being washed to the sea which troubled him economically, (laughs) but also spiritually, because he thought he couldn't believe that God would allow the earth simply to be eroded down to sea level. And so he was actively looking for some evidence of rejuvenation, (laughs) something that would uplift the land and and bring it back from being just eroded steadily. And he saw evidence of this at a famous outcrop in Scotland. Um, And in doing that, I don't think I want to go into it in much detail, but recognized how old the earth must be and kind of shattered the the literal biblical interpretation of the earth as being 6,000 or so years old. Um, He realized there was in this outcrop evidence of a mountain belt that had in fact been eroded to sea level and realized that that couldn't possibly have happened in 6,000 years. And so he gave us this idea that we could use our, our modern knowledge of rates of processes to make inferences about what happened in the past. So that was the beginning of the, the methodology of modern geology. And that, um, that idea and different depictions of that outcrop were widely distributed around the world. And, and that's um, the cover of your book. Is that right? Um, something similar. similar. There's, there's a picture in the book of it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then the, the person who really championed this idea of what we call uniformitarianism, which is just the present is the key to the past, was someone who came in the next generation, also British, someone named Charles Lyle, who was a virtuosic speaker. And he went on lectures in the United States, went to you know little opera halls and things in the 1820s, 30s, and 40s, espousing this idea of a very ancient earth that we could begin to unlock the secrets of. And this was also a time that Egyptology was really popular. People mm. were Um, excavating ancient Egypt. And so I think in the public's mind, there was just this fascination with these ancient worlds, one human, the the ancient Egypt, but also these much more ancient worlds. And so there was this this time in the early 1800s where the public was really fascinated with the idea of deep time and, and geologic investigation. Lyle wrote a book, Principles of Geology, which was kind of the original you know, kind of (laughs) um, reference work in geology that Darwin took on the voyage of the Beagle. And that work hugely influenced Darwin's thinking about how slow incremental processes could cause big changes over time. And it was Darwin, to answer your question, with the publication of Origin of Species, 1859, although that was 20 years after he went on the voyage of the Beagle, he was so timorous about publishing that book. (laughs) took him 20 years, Mm. even though he had the idea you know, in the Galapagos, um, that was the thing that changed because it was one thing to be talking about these ancient worlds in a kind of general sense. It was another thing to be saying, well, we are um, part of a, a continuum of evolution from earlier organisms. And that, at least in this country, has always been the sticking point. Um, people don't like that idea. But the well, idea of deep time, at least, wasn't itself that threatening initially. Right, right. I mean, what what jumps out immediately to me when when you mentioned that the way that presentation might have been heard was that 
it, it could be interpreted if we start to see our, because I, I, I've spoken about this with a songwriter about a, a particular phrase he used in a song that we are just this molecule of love. We're here for a moment and the moment burns away. And I just, you know, I describe how hopeful that sounds to me um, to, to be a part of something that is moving and is here for a moment. And then it's gone like everything else uh, that we belong here. And yet at the same time, I can hear, the flip side of that, the fear, back to the idea of chronophobia, that oh, we're here for a moment and mm -hmm. then we're gone. Like how that um, fervor of denialism would have taken hold because of that fear. And I, th I think you actually write about, I'll just read this um, quote that, that you mentioned in the book, a noteworthy psychological study suggests that resistance to the concept of evolution is rooted in more existential dread than religious doctrine. And that it declines, the, the fear of time declines as people become more familiar with stories from the natural world. That it's in fact, mm -hmm. it's almost, we can look at it as a, as a race, like who's telling more stories? <laughs> and if, if the organization of a th a theology, the or organized religion was telling more stories, and we know that that was certainly true, that they were centers of culture and commerce and society, those stories would have been uh, pre predominating. And, and it sounds like you're, you're, you you want to tell the world and, and other people that there are many more stories. It's, there are, and they're, yeah. they're richer stories. I mean, I, at the risk of offending anyone. That's the word I was going to use. <laughs> um, I, I guess, you know, the, to me, the Genesis version is a beautiful metaphorical story, but it's kind of like a child's it's a, it's a little fairy tale yeah. compared with the actual... Under our understanding as scientists of the deep, complex, rich, nuanced story. Yeah. And, and that's, I guess, I feel, it, it, I feel saddened when people are not even receptive to that. I would say as a scientist, my sense of awe in the natural world, <laughs> you know, is, it's only enhanced by my scientific understanding. I, right. I am reverential right. of the complexity of the natural world, the creation, however you want to imagine it came into being. I do have almost a spiritual response to my scientific understanding of that. And so right. it hurts me <laughs> in some yeah. visceral way when people would say that my whole field is, is somehow antithetical to Christianity or any other religious belief. I just, right, right. I, I said, no, I, I reject that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm with you, Marcia. I mean, I, I, I feel that um, for me, at least I'll just speak personally that for, for too long, I think I've thought of myself as a closeted atheist, which makes no sense. Actually. I, I'm not an atheist. I, it, that word makes no sense. Um, and, and it's also an emotionally laden term. And I know you're not here to talk about religion and atheism, but I'll, I'll confess this anyway, you know, that, that, being a spiritual person can is so substantial, right? We have, we, there is so much to stand on as, as spiritual people that our entire beings are spiritual. So um, just to get back to, to, to your subject here, how, how do you, um, you seem to do an amazing job and it sounds like you've had personal experiences learning, maybe making mistakes as a younger professor um, encountering uh, young people who are, um, you know, maybe because of their developmental stage uh, for one reason, or maybe because of their background culturally um, or, or religiously, they are not open or in fact, very skeptical of you as a, as a person who wants to broaden their, open their minds, right. Um, to new ideas. How, how did you, how, how do you suggest we, we respond to others in this topic? And even the way we conduct this conversation, you and I, how should, you know, what are some things that you've learned about engaging with people who are highly skeptical, in fact, maybe hostile towards uh, a scientific view of the earth or geology? Yeah, and I've encountered that probably more um, in an interactions, not with so much with students, but I, I do make an effort to do a lot of public outreach events. I, you know, talk to the Kiwanis Club and, <laughs> you know, different groups like that, deliberately trying to cross over the many things that divide us. Mm. And in interacting with groups like that, I think finding some common ground is the key thing to, to establish that you share some fundamental values. Most of us would, I mean, in this part of the world, many people do have strong connections to um, beautiful state parks or lakes or natural areas. 
we, we share that in common. We're, we're proud of the way that Wisconsin has stewarded our, our natural history. Um, and so that's a starting point. So people get engaged with what is the story of, of that place. And I think when we talk about things like climate change, which is really the urgent issue of our time once mm. we get out of the COVID right. tunnel, right. you know, a good way to just take the, the tone of all of that down a little bit is saying, what, what do you aspire to for your children and your grandchildren? Um, you know, what sort of world would you like them to live in and, and ask them then to reflect on what changes they've seen in the landscape in their time. So if I'm speaking to older people around here in rural Wisconsin, people have seen the evidence of climate change firsthand. They may not call it that, but when you start thinking about what were, what were winters like when you were growing up, mm. one really, you know, specific anecdote in my own hometown of Northwestern Wisconsin is that the I think it was the local Rotary Club used to put a, a car, a junker car out on the ice on the lake in town every year. And then they would sell raffle tickets. And the person who guessed the date and time that the car would go down um, cl most closely would win the raffle. <laughs> and these days the car goes down. It usually it was like out there until late April. Mm -hmm. when the, wow. When it's getting really, mm -hmm. And, you know, I'm, I've checked in with the local newspaper there because I thought that's an interesting record of climate change. More and more, that car's going down in January. Mm. And, and so there, there are things like that. Just let's, let's draw on our own experiences here and talk about this and, yeah. and then, yeah. you know, kind of find common ground, I, you know, literally. <laughs> right. This land that we share, we mm. all have some roots here. And I, I find that a, a useful thing that breaks down the assumptions that we're carrying about each other. Right, right. Um, one of the things I follow closely is uh, in, in my sort of hobby sort of time, I guess, is is the science of space. And astronauts have uh, pretty much to a person described this experience, uh, whether they were, they, many of them were probably environmentalists before going up, but some of the early astronauts, I'm not so sure about that. Um, but they describe almost to a person coming back fundamentally changed when they see the earth from space. And of course, people know the the images of the earth rise um, was uh, a catalyst for the environmental movement, um, Silent Spring coming out around that time. So, um, I, I, you know, one day perhaps we'll, we'll all get a chance or our kids or their kids will get a chance to go up in space and, and look back at this earth. Um, and that could be one way perhaps people wake up to how fragile this is. But Short of that, I wonder, you mentioned some, some ideas in your book, um, and I, w I want you to mention, can you speak about the idea of how fishing, with, fishing for sturgeon um, could actually be a pretty decent analog? I mean, you don't make, mention this reference to space. I'm sort of making that connection. <laughs> well, that top-down view, I would be, I'll talk about the sturgeon in a second, but that's really what the geological worldview is, is this mm. capacity to imagine in the mind's eye, the earth from outside through all of time, you know, having this really big holistic top-down view. Um, and that's what, you know, it was, it's too much in a single volume, but I, I, I strove to give people something like that in an impressionistic kind of way in the book. Right. We're not all going to be able to be in the space shuttle and, yeah. in space and see that, but, but to have in the mind's eye some sense of the, the grandeur of the whole story on a global scale is what geologists do. Um, and I used as a micro example of some kind of, you know, teleporting ourselves is this, um, the sturgeon spearing season in our part of Wisconsin. We have a, a very large inland lake called Lake Winnebago. It's very shallow, but it's big. It's the biggest. You can see it on the state of Wisconsin, you know, the feature. Mm. <laughs> and it has the largest um, population of lake sturgeon in North America. And every season when it's frozen over, um, a limited number of licenses are given to people to spear these fish, which seems really brutal, but they're very big fish. And to actually be there in the right time and spear them and get out, get them out of the water. Is, it's a is pretty, pretty fair difficult. fight for the fish. It, it, it is a fair fight. Yeah. yeah. And the season is also closed down right away. If people catch a certain number, some years, the season only lasts a couple hours. Mm -hmm. If the water clarity is really good, more people can catch them. So it's, it's actually a wonderful example of a sustainable resource. And it was 
a case where people came together in our area. It was in the 1950s where people started realizing the the population was almost being fished to extinction. And how big are the, the sturgeon? Some are up to 200 some pounds. Wow. Yeah. And old, like 120 years old in some cases. So they, they embody <laughs> some longer time span. Mm -hmm. And there's this world just under our feet. The, the lake at its deepest is like 22 feet deep. And, you know, it's, to me, there's this amazing feeling that there's this other world just under the ice. And in the winter, you are just near it. Mm. <laughs> there's swimming around down there. Right. Um, but it's a success story. It's one example of how people of different backgrounds and political beliefs came together successfully and said, we need to have some self-restraint here or all of us are going to lose. Right. And, you know, in a, a time when, environmentalism wasn't even a thing. This was in the mid fifties. People said, let's, let's work with fisheries biologists, figure out the sustainable take each year, let the population rebound and everybody plays by the rules. And it's, it's a really celebratory event. I hope that will, I, it should happen. It's outdoors. And mm -hmm. I don't really like seeing those fish taken out of the water, but I like seeing the people gathered together for that mm -hmm. event. Mm -hmm. The way we, we the way we used to really is, is you know, to yeah. sort of chip All in and figure out how to get our food. Running. Right. Yeah. And I, right. I often bring international students out there on the lake. We drive out in the university van. And <laughs> <laughs> um, so it's, it's a gathering point and we're all marveling together at this natural wonder. Right. Right. Yeah. It's amazing. So, and I wonder if there's ways in which that could be done. In, in other ways, and it seems like your your book and your your mission is to is to call for these types of creative and and it's not as though the sturgeon hunt was cooked up by environmentalists. It's clearly a, a naturally evolved thing in the in the culture, and it has become integrated with and happens to fulfill all of the roles like we talked about earlier. Like we, we can we can have fun, we can hunt, we can do crazy things on ice, <laughs> and and honor the things that are. Um, part of our fabric of who we are. Um, wow. Uh, what other things can, are, are, are important for people to know about that are out there that help us uh, expand our time frame? Because I think that's, a, that's something we do, but a lot of people turn to mindfulness now. I have taught mindfulness and have written extensively on that, the subject of mindfulness, which is really just paying attention on purpose to the present moment without trying to change it. That's what mindfulness is. And I'll talk more about that on other episodes. Um, timefulness, your, your concept, um, includes really the, the, some of the same concepts of mindfulness. Tell me about some of the other projects that are out there that you, you've written about in the book that, that uh, promote this long thinking. Well, I cite some artistic projects um, that they might seem kind of gimmicky or trivial, but I think they're demonstration projects in a way for how we can start thinking on intergenerational timescales. That's to me, one of the central problems is that we have so few mechanisms in our government, our economic systems. We're, we're, we're thinking at best on a couple of years ahead. We're, we're not thinking yeah. decadally, much yeah. less on century timescales. So we're not thinking intergenerationally. Mm -hmm. So I mentioned in the book, a couple of projects, um, there is the 10,000 year clock project of the Long Now Foundation um, in West Texas. It's actually Jeff Bezos's property. Right. <laughs> um, and the Long Now is trying to design and build a clock that could run completely on solar and wind power on its own and keep time over 10,000 years. You think, who needs a clock like that? But it's, it's a demonstration project of thinking on long millennial timescales and thinking in 10,000 years, we'll be in a very different orbital situation with the Earth's tilt around and or orbit around the sun. Some serious um, heavy duty so engineering. To, to, exactly. <laughs> so thinking on millennial timescales is a really bracing challenge. So that's, that's one dramatic example. Well, and, and um, can I just ask a geeky question about that? Like, so it, it's it's self power generating, and it's, it has something to do with the temperature differential in the shaft of metal that from from that's drilled into the earth. Right, expansion and contraction of the metal is actually harnessed as a power source, as is wind. I guess wow. this thing is not built yet; it's still being designed. <laughs> wow. Okay. <laughs> I did actually meet the person I gave 
a talk at the Long Now Foundation, which is the group that's underwriting mm. this project. And I, I talked with Alex Rose, who's one of the designers, and it's still very much a work in progress. Which They've is a, a site. Which is a great talk, by the way, and I'll put that link to others uh, so they can they can hear you oh, give that presentation. Oh, that much, he, he also talks about his project. <laughs> People okay. want to know about the Long Now Clock. So anyway, it, I think it's it's you know mainly in some ways it's a demonstration project about mm-hmm. thinking on millennial timescales. Right. Whether it actually gets built, I don't know. Jeff Bezos is underwriting it. He's got the money. Yep. Okay. Um, another example is uh, the uh, the I'm forgetting the, the example, the name, the um, the project of planting trees in a forest near Oslo, the long time project I think it's called and. Um, so famous authors, first Margaret Atwood and others have been asked each year, starting about five years ago, to write a short story that is being put in a vault somewhere. Meanwhile, some trees have been planted north of Oslo that will grow into a forest. And 100 years from now, they'll be harvested and turned into paper. And all of these stories written by a succession of famous writers in the next century will be published in an anthology that none of us will be able to read because we will be long gone. (laughs) And it's an interesting idea. And and the Mm. point is to practice intergenerational cooperation. So in in doing this project, it, it has to be designed in a way that will hand off responsibility in a seamless way to to new people incrementally so that there's no loss of continuity of the project, but the people who initiated it will never live to see its fruition. I mean, just imagine, Marsha, if if that if 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 that kind of thinking could be scaled up in some way, integrated into our what we think of as a sacred thing, democracy. Um, to, to be to be able to pass on, I mean, we, we pride ourselves and we should about succession of government being being uh, hopefully smooth uh, and institutionalized, but we, why not institutionalize long, like seventh generation thinking in politics? Absolutely. That would be Absolutely. radical. Yeah, it would be radical. And yet it's so sensible. <laughs> right, right. So, yeah. You also mentioned the 639-year-old song. Yeah. <laughs> That sounds really, really <laughs> interesting. Right. So um, the experimental composer, oh, and I'm sorry, his name is. I'll get a, I'll moment. get a link. I'll put it up on the site. Yeah. But they, they actually just changed the note. So this isn't a church in Germany. <laughs> it's a composition that is designed to last more than 600 years. The tones last in most cases, months, and they're on a, a, an organ and a, a stone is laid on the pedal of the organ. So j- just um, to be clear, it's, it's, a, it's a performance. It's not like, it's not sheet, sheet music. I mean, anybody could write sheet music with a right, really- Right, right, right. Just say, okay, a rest <laughs> yeah, for eight right, months. Right. Just <laughs> give it a rest for eight months and then play. But this is actually a performance with a physical instrument and it is an organ? Yes, yeah, an old organ in a church in Germany. Um, and so rests may last for months. Individual tones may last for months or years. It's convenient. If they have to work on the organ, let's just do it during one of the <laughs> rest yeah, during the rest time. <laughs> um, and in fact, they had to change the tone they, just a month or so ago. One of the big tone changes just happened like wow. in August of this year. So The, the again, things people don't know that, about that are happening all, all around yeah, us. Exactly. <laughs> It can seem gimmicky. You think, okay, a 639-year-old organ performance. I mean, I'll be, I'll be frank. Like, uh, uh, what human is not gimmicky? I mean, you know, I, 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 we think we like to think of ourselves as sophisticated, and we, I guess we are. We are, right? But <laughs> we, right. All, we all need um, hooks, I think. And, and as, a, as a herd, especially as a, as a species, we all need something that's um, compelling us, right? It's obvious but um, maybe not so obvious in some of our, in some of our uh, political discussions. Um, yeah, I, I guess I, this, is, this has been amazing. It, it, you, oh, you mentioned the, the Department of the, of the Future. Maybe we can, you can <laughs> end on that. Um, what would it be like to have somebody who um, is in charge of uh, advocating for the future? Uh, I'm, I'm reminded of Lois Lowry's book. Um, oh, the giver. the giver, yeah. The giver, and, and then when I read about this idea of the Department of the Future, because the giver, uh, and then the the successive book is called Gathering Blue, I believe. 
And there's a concept in that book, um, the, the giver is, I mean, it's just breathtaking in, in, in its simplicity and its um, uh, bracingness um, because of the, the way the, the way society is, is looked upon uh, as not able to have any emotion. And then they, they have this concept of one person, they allow one person in society to, to remember things. That's that. That was the plot of the giver, and that one person has to hold all the memories, and has, and sees the world emotionally. Everyone else sees the world in black and white. But the, the department of the future almost sounds as though that you would be appointing somebody to, in in a government position, to to actually embody and remember mm. something like yeah, that. Yeah, and I did remember the the composer of the six hundred thirty nine year old song. It's yes. John Cage. John Cage. <laughs> um, but the idea of the Department of the Future is Kurt Vonnegut, the great mm. novelist. He said, you know, I don't understand why there's no provision for my children and grandchildren. We should have a Department of the Future. And since writing the book, a number of people have written to me saying, you know what? There is a Department of the Future in Wales. The government, the, you know, Wales is part of the UK, but they have their own um, government. And there is, in fact, a Secretary of the Future in oh, Wales. Oh, Wales. <laughs> All right. But yeah, the point would be that we really are, especially in this country, so locked into the immediate future. The the four year mm -hmm. presidential cycle right now is looming mm -hmm. very large in our, right. our minds, right. and there really are few incentives at the in the political realm or in the economic world for people who who are taking the long view. Mm -hmm. And I think you know technology the 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 very immediate nature of online communications in some ways, although it's essential, especially in this time of pandemic, um, just shortens our attention spans even further. And the generations are becoming increasingly isolated from each other. Right. And all of these things work against taking the long view. Right. Right. Well, and I, I, I'm just so glad that you are out there doing this. And what I wanted to highlight for people is that I think all of us, uh, those of us who who care about things and, and are active either politically or economically um, in, 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 in raising awareness or sounding the alarm that I think it's so important to remember that we are in this together um, and that it's not doom and gloom. I mean, there are, there are people doing, and of course we need to sound the alarm and say that these, there's things going wrong, but as a, as a person who treats anxiety for a living, <laughs> I can say that, um, you know, anxiety is a real problem. And I think for our children who are hearing, I mean, we lived, I'll, I don't know about you, Marsha. I, I grew up, I was born in 1977. So I grew up in the eighties under what was apparently, well, it was not apparently, but it was the specter of nuclear war in the cold war. And I frankly don't remember feeling anxious one second about that. Um, <laughs> but somehow I think the conversation, and I, and I think this is good, it is permeated in, in the anxiety about the future and environmentalist um, uh, activism has permeated our, our children's psyche um, in ways that the Cold War, I mean, there were people going around trying to get everyone, act, uh, you know, involved in the Cold War. I mean, so that's a totally different thing. Um, but there is a sense of dread, I think, when what I hear from people is I overload, you know, um, mm -hmm. clicktivism is a word that gets used, like, oh, it's another thing we have to get upset about and outraged about. And, and so I think there is fatigue, um, and, and of course, one of the things that I'm, what I feel like is my purpose is to bring up the idea that, hey, we're all human and we burn out <laughs> and I'm exhibit A. So um, we're in this together and people like you are out there doing this work, raising awareness. And, you know, if we all do our part, then we'll have uh, a much have a easier lift to do this. Um, any any last things you wanted to to mention? Well, I think... Following up on, on that is if we identified ourselves more as earthlings, we would find solace in that. That we have, you know, much more in common <laughs> than than we don't. And learning the narratives of this place, for me at least, is existentially really comforting. This is yeah. an old, durable, you know, primarily benevolent planet. <laughs> 
And and no, and understanding that is a is a, a real source of comfort and, and reassurance. Yeah, yeah. But you know, yeah. There, we we need to understand how it works and how we can live peaceably with a dynamic planet. That's not to say it's you know it's always stable or predictable. Right, right. But it's it's a very bountiful place if we well, learn to live well on it. And it's safe. It's safe to associate ourselves with being human, being being temporal. It, it's not mm-hmm. scary at all. In fact, it's 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 a relief to know that things don't work because of magic, and it's not because of willy nilly things that we have to sort of you know do superstitious things about. It's it's because, it's because yeah. And yeah, there's a there's a flow to it. Right. There's a logic to the landscape and to the way things mm. work, and I think having some understanding of that makes you feel rooted as a as a human as an yeah. earthling. <laughs> Well, thank you for helping me feel rooted in, in, um, during our, our trek to the Grand Canyon and uh, beyond. And the name of your book, again, um, if you want to say that and tell people where they can find you or uh, interact with you in some way uh, and, and hear, hear you speak. So the book is Timefulness, How Thinking Like a Geologist Can Help Save the World. I'm emphasizing the help part. <laughs> Um, I teach at Lawrence University in Appleton, Wisconsin. I am not on social media by choice, but it's not too difficult to find me. Um, my name is pretty distinctive, so I'm sure you can look me up if you want. Thank you, Marsha, for being with us today. Thanks for a great conversation. Thanks for listening to The Soul of Life. This is Keith Miller. Oh, and don't forget, please leave a thumbs up or a like for this episode wherever you're listening so that others like you may find the soul of life. I mean, really, it's not every day you get to share the soul of life with someone. Okay, so you can post a comment or question on souloflifeshow.com. I'd love to hear from you. And please subscribe now to get the next episode. I look forward to sharing more of my soul of life with you. I like it and it's not harsh to my eardrum. All right, I will go.